Thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak at this virtual conference. I'm going to be talking about unlocking the potential of cloud native science. Before we get started, just a little introduction. Um, my name is Ryan Abernathy. I'm a physical oceanographer and I'm associate professor at Columbia University Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. My research is about ocean circulation and transport. Um, I also am very involved in the open source scientific software world as a core developer of the X-Ray package and Czar package and a co-founder of the Pangeo project. This talk today is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to try and define what it means to do cloud native science and what are the benefits of working this, this way. For part two, I'm going to give you a demonstration of a Pangeo workflow in the cloud. Pangeo is the project that I help lead that is, invo uh, that is involved in building cloud native scientific research tools using open source Python technology. And in part three, I'm going to take a deeper dive uh, into the Pangeo technology stack and talk about the, the different software components that made the demo work. So just to motivate things a little bit, here is a fascinating animation from NASA showing a lot of different remotely sensed and simulated fields from the Earth system. And this is just a beautiful movie that really gets across the complexity of Earth system data and um, the, the excitement of uh, studying the Earth system this way. But it also hints at the challenges uh, of dealing with the complexity and size of these data sets. Here's another figure from NASA. It shows uh, the growth of, the, um, of NASA's Earth science cloud data uh, anticipated over the next five years. Uh, and you can see that on the y-axis, that's petabytes. And we're getting up above 200 petabytes just within a few years. So uh, this volume of data poses a huge challenge to our scientific workflows, one that cloud computing can really help with. So what do scientists want to do with all this data anyway? I think it's important that we, we think about that. There's a lot of different workflows. I'm not just addressing a single one, but I'm trying to think about the, the sort of broad uh, view of, of what scientists actually do with data. Well, a lot of what scientists do is pretty simple statistics, but using large data sets. There's a lot of value in that. So here, we just took the mean of global uh, sea level satellite observations uh, to see the very um, worrying trend of ri rising sea level directly from remote sensing data. A lot of folks want to analyze spatiotemporal variability, find patterns, and understand patterns of variability in simulations and, and observations. And of course, increasingly, we want to train machine learning models to make predictions and make inferences from our data. Now, all these three examples have in common uh, the fact that they really need to process a large volume of data. They, they need to uh, work with a whole data set, not just some small piece. Um, and that, that poses a real challenge. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you kind of grew up with the download model of, of scientific uh, data where as a first step you download uh, some files from a server and then on your computer you clean and organize uh, those data files and finally you get to work analyzing your data. Um, this is not uh, you know, a unique uh, workflow um, for, for earth science or space science. Uh, this, this survey from 2016 showed that um, across all of data science most time scientist time is spent uh, collecting data, downloading data, and cleaning and organizing data sets. It's 80% of, of a scientist's time. And so if we can improve this, we can really um, get more productivity um, out of our scientific workforce. So the download model might work fine, and it might be sustainable if your data are size is measured in megabytes, or even if your data size is measured in gigabytes. Today, a lot of us are working with data whose size is measured in terabytes, and it's very painful to try and download it and clean and organize all of that data. And if the data are measured in petabytes, forget it. There's no way that you're going to be able to download that data to your computer. So a really exciting alternative to the download model is what I like to call open cloud architecture. Uh, in open cloud architecture, we use cloud computing uh, to do our analysis 
very close to where the data live, bypassing the download step. Um, we're able to take advantage of such fa fantastic open source tools for interactive computing. Um, today there are many different languages you can work with, Python, Julia, or R that can extract insights from data. And the Jupyter project is, is uh, one way you can use to um, work with remote computing systems so that you don't have to download data. Instead, you can just interact with remote computers through your web browser. Within that cloud computing environment, we have amazing uh, tools for distributed parallel computing, such as Spark or Dask, that can really accelerate workflows um, by distributing our comput computations across many compute nodes. And then on the data side, there's a lot of exciting development happening uh, in the area of analysis ready data and cloud optimized formats that allow us to really quickly get to work with large complex data sets. Um, this type of architecture is very general and very flexible. It can be deployed on any cloud um, or also on on-premises architecture and to some degree can also be deployed on traditional high performance computing environments. So before getting into the technical details, I want to try and explain and motivate why I think that this is a really um, productive direction for uh, scientific research to be headed in. So why cloud native? Why do we want to transition to this type of workflow? Um, we recently uh, released a preprint uh, sort of outlining the principles that underline cloud native uh, scientific research. And we identified eight motivating factors, performance, reliability, cost effectiveness, collaboration, reproducibility, creativity, downstream impacts, and access and inclusion that are all facilitated by migrating workflows to the cloud. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'll just draw out a few highlights. So a huge motivation, of course, is performance. If we have these massive terabyte or petabyte scale data sets, um, using cloud computing allows us to take advantage of massive computational resources, elastic scaling, and high throughput data storage for distributed processing. That's, that's fantastic and can really accelerate our science. But it's, it's more than just computing. Cloud, cloud native computing uh, also supports collaboration and reproducibility. It does that by providing all collaborators across the world access to the exact same computational environment and data. So rather than ha having you know, each scientist work in their little silo on their laptop where they have their environment and their data, um, we can share those environments and share that data. Um, and that really unlocks a lot of potential for collaboration and it automatically makes all of our results reproducible. Another exciting uh, motivation for cloud native computing is the possibility to interact with industry. It's well known that um, you know, the commercial world and startups and tech companies build all of their products in the cloud. And so uh, by placing data and, and resources in the cloud, we create this um, pathway to opening up downstream commercial impacts uh, from our data. And that's something that's very important to a lot of data providers. Finally, I, I think there's a, an overlooked but crucial aspect of access and inclusion in cloud computing. Um, when you use cloud computing, you're not constrained by your local infrastructure. So here's an example. Um, we're starting to work with this coastal ocean environment summer school in Ghana, a fantastic group of researchers who are full of ideas and enthusiasm and passion for uh, oceanography, um, but don't have a lot of uh, uh, local infrastructure, don't even have uh, fully reliable electricity, but they do have internet. Um, so by um, providing cloud computing, uh, cloud data and cloud computing environments, we allow anyone in the world to participate in cutting edge computing uh, data intensive research. That's very exciting. So some of the pillars of cloud native computing that I uh, outlined uh, before are the following. Uh, we start with analysis ready cloud optimized data. I think I really think it's data that's going to bring a lot of scientists to the cloud. The potential to skip downloading and instead get right to work on data. To work with that data, we need tools for data proximate computing. So I mentioned Jupyter, uh, tools for working with data through the browser. And then finally, we need um, in order to really you know get 
the power out of the cloud to take advantage of its, of its uh, computing potential, it's fantastic to have access to uh, on-demand, scalable, distributed computing. What I mean by that is if, if I have to process through a huge volume of data, um, it's great to be able to get 100 compute nodes and use them for just a few minutes um, to do my calculation. Uh, that's possible in the cloud, and, and I only pay for exactly what I use. Um, so this is the type of new workflow and new, new way of interacting with data and computing that the cloud opens up. That's not really possible in traditional computing environments, even on high performance computing environments. So before diving sort of into the technical details of how these work, I'd like to give a demo of Pangeo, our solution to uh, cloud native um, computing. Uh, for scientific research. So if you'd like to follow along with this example, you can follow the links here on this page. There's a tiny U URL short link. And this is going to bring you to a page in Pangeo Gallery, um, which uh, will, will link to an interactive session that you can open up and follow along if you wish. Uh, so now I'm going to switch over to the demo. OK, so we're, no we're now starting part two of my talk in which I'm going to give a demonstration of some of the principles of cloud native computing using Pangeo. So our starting point is this page, gallery.pangeo.io, um, which you can go to yourself. And on this page, you'll see a, a, a lot of different galleries um, of different science and technology examples. I'm going to pick this one, which is physical oceanography. I'm a physical oceanographer, so I help develop these examples. When I click on this gallery, I'll get brought to this page, um, which gives me a basic description of what's in this gallery and a link to several notebooks. I'm going to click on the first one, Sea Surface Altimetry Data Analysis. Now here we can see a static view of this um, notebook. Uh, and that's, that's a, enough from some people who just want to look at the code and understand how it works. But what we're going to do is actually click this button up here, Launch Binder. And that's going to bring us to uh, a, that's going to start a live session where we can actually run this notebook and run the code interactively and see the results. Um, and when you click on this um, step, it's going to take um, a minute or two perhaps to get the, your Jupyter server started up. Um, in this case, it happened pretty quickly. And it's going to bring us right to this notebook. Um, so right now, we are in Jupyter Lab. Um, which is an interactive browser-based computing environment, and we're running Python in it, but we could be running uh, many different programming languages. Um, so I'm just going to walk through this notebook and sort of illustrate some of the principles that I mentioned earlier in my talk, namely analysis-ready, cloud-optimized data, data-proximate computing, and uh, elastic, on-demand, scalable, distributed computing. Um, so I'm just going to close this tab over here just to create a, a little more space. And um, perhaps I'll make things a little bigger so we can see a little more clearly. So um, I'm going to start just by running this first cell. Uh, you can run these cells by pressing play if you haven't used Jupyter Notebook before, or shift return. Uh, here I'm just importing the packages I need to use for my analysis. Um, this next cell here, initialize data set, this is a key step. So here I'm pulling a data set from uh, our cloud data library, which I'll talk more about a little bit later. Um, but the, the, the important part is that I'm opening a catalog here and then selecting a particular data set, see surface height. And I'll run this cell. And uh, what has been returned to me is an X-ray data set object. And this is a great example of analysis-ready data. So this is a data set that has been extracted from the Copernicus uh, Marine uh, environment monitoring system um, of sea level uh, observed with satellite altimeters. You can see this X-ray um, object contains uh, dimensions, coordinates, data variables, and attributes. And these attributes have a lot of useful metadata about the data. It tells me about the license. It tells me about um, the producer, a lot of details about how the um, data were created. Uh, and then uh, what I've got here are these um, different data variables and coordinates. Now, um, if I click on one of these um, over here, I can see, for example, if I click on SLA, I'll see sea level anomaly. That's the name of this variable. 
Um, so I have a lot of rich metadata um, in this representation of the data set. And I can also look at the data itself. Um, so uh, a really important point here is that we open this object and it contains the entire data record. It, in, some might call this a data cube um, it, because its dimensions are latitude, longitude, and time. I didn't have to download a thousand different files. I didn't have to painstakingly combine them into one analysis ready object. I have all of my data at my fingertips and ready to go. Um, it is stored in the ZAR format and it's represented here using Dask which is a library that can uh, represent large arrays uh, as virtual chunks. So in this case, the total array size is almost 74 gigabytes, but the chunk size is only um, 40 megabytes. And those are chunks that we can easily work with. Um, so this is my analysis ready cloud optimized data. Now this data is living in Google Cloud Storage um, in the same uh, region of Google Cloud where this, this notebook is running, which means I'm, I'm very close to the data, so I can do data approximate computing and work with this data set without explicitly downloading anything. So to illustrate that, I'm going to run this line here, which uses the hollow views and hvplot packages to um, make an interactive dynamic uh, map of the data. So uh, it's just uh, rendering this map. So here, here we go. So here we can see this um, map of my sea level anomaly. This should look familiar to most people. And this is an interactive widget, so I can mouse over it and see values. And I can also zoom into my favorite area. So I like the Gulf Stream region. So we're going to zoom in here, and it's going to re-render a view that's tailored for the, the resolution of my screen. And I can even animate this just by clicking play here. And it's going to show the evolution of the sea level um, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, what's happening here is data is being streamed directly from cloud storage into my notebook. And it's very responsive uh, because we're doing data approximate computing. We can access that cloud storage with very high throughput. OK, um, so that's cool. Um, it's, it's fun to do um, uh, an interactive analysis like this. But what if I want to do some processing of the data, of the whole data set? For example, to compute the time series of sea level. OK, so what I want to do now is show how we can uh, scale up our computation. What if we don't just want to look at a small piece of the data, but we actually want to process the entire data set, uh, the entire 80 gigabyte uh, record of sea level? Well, uh, in Pangeo, that's what we use Dask for. So in this cell, I'm going to run this to start a new distributed Dask cluster. Uh, this is going to use. Um, compute nodes that are provisioned on the fly. This is called uh, elastic, elastically scaled computing. And you can see here, I've, I've configured my cluster to scale between 1 and 20 compute nodes. Uh, and so what this is going to do is going to give me the, the, the ability to use um, all of those nodes in parallel to speed up uh, my analysis and processing of the data. And just to visualize what we're doing, I'm going to use the Dask uh, lab extension for Jupyter. I'm going to just take this URL and paste it in here. And what we're going to—that's what the, that's going to allow us to do—is to visualize exactly what um, our uh, what what our Dask cluster is doing. And so this this is really useful if you want to understand um, uh, how this works. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to do here um, is now. Uh, run this cell, which computes the mean sea level, taking the mean over dimensions, latitude, and longitude, and just loading that into memory. So I'm just going to run this cell. And we'll see it's going to uh, initialize and start running tasks on my cluster. Uh, so down here, I can see a progress bar that shows uh, how, how far along we are in each of these tasks. And up here, I see a visualization of what my cluster is doing. Um, right now, we only have one node. And, uh, and that node has two, two worker processes. But we can see it just scaled up. So we got a, a lot more uh, nodes in our cluster. And you can see these, these are all working in parallel. What they're doing is pulling data from Google Cloud Storage and working together to take the mean. So we have many, many uh, processes working together to speed up this computation. And when this progress bar gets all the way over to the right side, uh, That'll be done, and we'll have the answer we're looking for.
Um, so having the ability to sort of visualize what the cluster is doing um, and, uh, and understand you know, whether it's being efficient, uh, how it's spending its time, is a really useful feature of this dashboard. So we'll let that finish up here. And uh, now we're done, and now we can make a plot. So here's a plot of uh, the quantity we just calculated, the global mean sea level. We see both the um, daily and then the annual mean in orange. And this is a figure I showed earlier in, in the talk. And um, this, this really uh, is, a, is actually a very important, scientifically important figure we just generated. This is sea level rise. We can see starting from the beginning of the satellite record in the early 90s. Um, we, have a, we can see uh, about 10 centimeters of sea level rise from the data. Um, so uh, this basically gets across the, the main points I wanted to make uh, in this demo. Um, we used uh, data proximate computing to quickly load up analysis ready data. Um, and then we used um, uh, elastically scaled computing to uh, perform an, an interesting calculation processing a large volume of data without ever downloading anything. You can see up here our cluster is on the way to scaling back down to just one worker. So we provision those compute nodes just for really less than a minute and now let them go and, and that's all we'll pay for. So in the next part of the demo I'm gonna sort of look under the hood a little bit and explain a little bit more about uh, what technologies power this demonstration. Okay, hey, welcome back to the slides for the final part of the presentation. We just saw a little demo of using Pangeo in the cloud. And now I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about the Pangeo project and the technology that underlies it. So Pangeo is a community platform for big data geoscience. It consists of open community, open source software, and open source infrastructure. And I'd like to acknowledge the support from our funders, the NSF EarthCube program, the NASA Access Program, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So Pangeo is first and foremost a community. It's a diverse community with many different participants, and participation is open to all. We have students, postdocs, faculty, and also software developers and data scientists. We have contributors from universities, national labs, industry, and NGOs. And our participants tend to come from the weather, climate, oceans, and geoscience spheres. But we feel the technology is pretty general, and so we really welcome collaborators from all scientific disciplines. And on this slide, you can see some logos of some of the institutions that are involved. As for our software, it's really important for me to emphasize that Pangeo is really embedded within the broader Python open source software ecosystem. In fact, there's no software package called Pangeo that you can install. Instead, Pangeo is an integration project about bringing all these different powerful open source tools together in a way that really meets the needs of geoscience uh, big data researchers. I'm really going to emphasize four main packages that play a key role in the project. These are ZAR, a storage library. DASC, a parallel computing library, X-Array, a high-level API for data analysis, and Jupyter, the interactive web-based computing platform. Um, so I'll, let me give you some idea of how these different packages work together to provide the experience that we saw in the demo. So sort of at the base of the stack is ZAR, which is uh, a storage format that is optimized for uh, large multi-dimensional arrays, uh, this, the kind we often find ourselves working with in geosciences. You can think of ZAR as uh, perhaps compatible with HDF5 type data. So um, ZAR allows us to store our data directly into cloud object storage, such as Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. Uh, and, and get really good performance with those uh, cloud object stores. And that's really important because object storage is really the 
most cost-effective and most performant way to work with data in the cloud. So working with object storage is a big part of being cloud native. Now, one layer above that is Dask, a flexible general purpose parallel computing framework that can be deployed really in, in, in almost any different context. In the cloud, we use Dask together with Kubernetes to provide auto-scaling, uh, which is, is what allowed that cluster we saw in the demo to scale up elastically from one worker node to 20 uh, as our computation needed it. Um, so Dask is really key to the sort of the distributed, uh, massively parallel nature of the Pangeo platform. One level of, above that is X-Array. X-Array is a high-level API for analysis of multidimensional labeled arrays. So X-Array is really built from the ground up to work with data that you would find in, for example, the NetCDF data model. Um, and, and that's what the user is mostly interacting with in Pangeo. The user is writing X-Array code and interacting with the, the cloud platform through a Jupyter notebook or a Jupyter lab. So Jupyter really provides the front end uh, for the Pangeo cloud experience. And everything goes through the browser as we saw in our, in our demo. Now this is sort of the foundation of Pangeo, but on top of that, it's possible to, possible to build more layers of more sort of high level domain specific logic. So for example, the XGCM package provides uh, analysis of finite volume data like from general circulation models. Climpred is an example of a package that is designed to work with uh, forecast data. Uh, so there's a whole ecosystem of higher level tools that can build on this foundation. Zooming in a little bit to, to sort of understand a little bit more technical detail about how these things work together. So when we're processing data in Pangeo, we generally have a DAS cluster that is pulling data directly from object store. And that data is czar data. It's pulling chunks of multidimensional arrays through using HTTP protocol. And then that data is being aggregated, reduced down, and sent back to the Jupyter Notebook um, where it can finally be visualized and, um, uh, and, and analyzed. And that's where the sort of interactive part of the experience occurs. So the Pangeo project operates quite a bit of infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, on the data side, we have a large catalog of analysis-ready cloud-optimized data stored in Zara format. And this data lives in many different places, uh, in Amazon, Google Cloud. We're starting to use Wasabi Cloud Storage and Open Storage Network as well. Over on the compute side, we operate three main types of services. One is Jupyter Hub, which uh, provides users access to sort of persistent com uh, computational resources where they can uh, launch Jupyter Notebooks. Um, binder is uh, something you may be familiar with. We run our own Binder service, which provides sort of ephemeral, ephemeral on-demand notebooks to anyone, to the general public, to um, sort of for demonstration and teaching purposes. And that's what we used in our demo today. And then finally, uh, we, we run a DAS gateway service, which allows us to provide these DAS clusters on demand to Pangeo users. As for the cloud data catalog, um, this is something that we're actively developing. Our goal is to provide analysis-ready, cloud-optimized data to our users. Um, so we have a catalog of data that has been uh, prepared and cleaned and provided in a really sort of um, ready-to-go uh, format. Um, and this really saves a lot of time uh, for, for users. Um, an, a good example is the Climate Model Intercomparison Project data set that we have um, developed in partnership with uh, Google Cloud and has recently been added to their public data sets program. So just to summarize, uh, I think some important pillars of cloud native computing are analysis ready cloud optimized data, data proximate computing, and on-demand scalable distributed computing. I presented Pangeo's solution for these different uh, areas, but I recognize that there are many different ways these principles can be implemented and many different tools and technologies um, that can be used to 
to provide this. So um, I'm really interested in learning what other projects are doing, how other projects are providing uh, cloud native scientific experiences. And that's why I'm really excited to be part of this workshop to learn more about what other fields are doing. If you would like to learn more about Pangeo, uh, here is, are some links to some of the different online uh, resources that we um, operate. If you want to get in touch with us and, and talk to us, I really recommend going through Discourse. Um, this is sort of our main discussion forum. We also have a blog where we are pr pretty active. So I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity, and I look forward to the day when we can meet in person and get to know each other better.